A reading from the book of the prophet Hosea. Come, let us return to the Lord. It is He who has rent, but He will heal us. He has struck us, but He will bind our wounds. He will revive us after two days. On the third day, He will raise us up to live in His presence. Let us know, let us strive to know the Lord. As certain as the dawn is His coming, and His judgment shines forth like the light of day. He will come to us like the rain, like spring rain that waters the earth. What can I do with you, Ephraim? What can I do with you, Judah? Your piety is like a morning cloud, like the dew that early passes away. For this reason I smote them through the prophets. I slew them by the words of my mouth. For it is love that I desire, not sacrifice, and knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. The Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It is mercy I desire and not sacrifice. It is mercy I desire and not sacrifice. Have mercy on me, O God, in your goodness. In the greatness of your compassion, wipe out my offense. Thoroughly wash me from my guilt, and of my sin cleanse me. It is mercy I desire, and not sacrifice. For you are not pleased with sacrifices. Should I offer a burnt offering, you would not accept it. My sacrifice, O God, is a contrite spirit, a heart contrite and humbled, O God, you will not spurn. It is mercy I desire, and not sacrifice. Be bountiful, O Lord, to Zion in your kindness, by rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. Then shall you be pleased with due sacrifices, burnt offerings, and holocausts. It is mercy I desire, and not sacrifice. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus addressed this parable to those who were convinced of their own righteousness and despised everyone else. Two people went up to the temple area to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other was a tax collector. The Pharisee took up his position and spoke this prayer to himself. O oh God, I thank you that I am not like the rest of humanity, greedy, dishonest, adulterous, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I pay tithes on my whole income. But the tax collector stood off at a distance, and would not even raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast and prayed, O oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, the latter went home justified, not the former. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and the one who humbles himself will be exalted. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. If you want to find evidence of someone's closeness to God, Look for how readily they admit that they are a sinner. Be merciful to me, O God, a sinner, this tax collector prayed. You know, the tax collectors were grouped in the minds of the people at the time of Jesus with murderers, adulterers. They worked not only for a foreign power, collecting tax for the Romans. But the way it was done was that the people didn't know how much that their particular area was being assessed for taxes. And so the tax collectors would collect more than was necessary to give to the Romans and keep the rest for themselves. They constantly were defrauding people in that way. This was really a group of people that was looked down on in fact, in one historian talks about a monument to an honest tax collector. 
In other words, a monument was necessary because it was such a, an unusual, extraordinary thing for these people to be honest. And yet we see, don't we, the love of Jesus and His mercy in calling Matthew, a tax collector, to be one of His apostles. Not just a disciple, an apostle. Be merciful, O God, to me, a sinner. Our spiritual journey starts, not with prayer, but with repentance. It starts with recognizing that we are in rebellion against God and that we need a Savior. It starts by recognizing as we humble ourselves, humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God and He will raise you on high, Peter says. We humble ourselves recognizing that we have sinned. You know, we especially who know the fullness of the truth in the gospel and teaching of Christ and His church are especially prone to this kind of temptation that Jesus describes in this parable because it's true to say that what pleases God is known to us and is not known to the other nations. We pray this in the Psalms. He has made known to Israel His laws and decrees. He has not done thus with any other nation. The people of Israel were quite aware that they were blessed above and beyond the rest of the world. God told them in giving them the land, the Holy Land, Beware of the nations around you. Do not mingle with them or adopt their practices. And it was because the Israelites did, in large measure, adopt their practices, including that of child killing like we do today with abortion, they were driven out of their own land that God gave them. That was the reason for the, the exile of the north from the, by the kingdom of Assyria and the south by Babylon. And yet to say what God told them, to acknowledge what God revealed to them, that, that by itself was not arrogance. Yes, what pleases God is known to us. He told us and He gave us more knowledge of His will than the other nations. No, it's not that way anymore. Jesus has announced the gospel to all the world. The church continues to do that. But still, there are so many who do not even know the name of Christ. So that makes you more blessed and more in possession of the truth, but it also makes you more responsible. But it doesn't make you better. If we have the fullness of truth, that still doesn't mean we can look down on those who don't. Because those who don't might be better in following God with the little that they do have than are we in being faithful to the vast amount of grace that we have. It's never a reason for self-righteousness. It's never a reason for looking down at others. And yet at the same time, it's never a reason for doubting that what we have is indeed the truth. You understand the balance that we have to engage in here. We have the truth. We know the mind and will of God in Jesus Christ. We know the difference between sin and virtue. As a matter of fact, see, some people use this parable to try to make you and me feel guilty for proclaiming the moral truth. Oh, you people are superior. You people are trying to put yourselves above everybody else. No, we're not. The Pharisee knew, rightly so, that being greedy and dishonest and adulterous was wrong, and he even knew, rightly so, that a lot of what the tax collectors were doing was wrong. God doesn't expect him to justify or minimize that. He forgot that pride was wrong, however. But look at the, the one who went home justified, the tax collector. It wasn't because he was obscuring the difference between right and wrong. It wasn't because he was neutralizing the difference between sin and virtue. He could not have knelt there and beat his breast and say, Oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner, unless he knew what sin was. And that's the mistake that our current culture falls into more than anything else. Oh, let's be humble. In other words, let's erase the distinction between 
right and wrong, truth and falsehood, good and evil, sin and grace. Let's erase the distinction. Everything goes, everybody. Adultery is okay now. Sexual activity with anyone you want is okay now. Abortion, it's all right. This is the mindset of those who want to erase the distinction between good and evil. And they think they do it, some of them, in the name of humility. Oh, we must not be arrogant to think that we know the moral law better than others do. Listen, if others are justifying the improper use of human sexuality outside of a marriage between one man and one woman, if others are trying to justify the killing of children by abortion, if others are trying to justify saying that there's some other way to salvation outside of Jesus Christ. It is not arrogance to say that those things are wrong. It is not arrogance. It is not contrary to the lesson Jesus is giving us here. Because if, again, we don't know the difference between sin and virtue, how can we beat our breasts and say, be merciful to me, a sinner? What sin did we commit? Of course this is predicated on knowing what God's moral truth is. No, what this is predicated on too is realizing that our first duty is to recognize that sinfulness in ourselves. Now, if we recognize it in ourselves, we will recognize it elsewhere. Not that we can peer inside the souls of others, but we can evaluate the actions on the outside And we can call people to repentance. Calling others to repentance does not in any way mean we are not repenting ourselves. In fact, we need to repent ourselves first so that we will be able to call others to repentance. Remember in another passage, Jesus says, Why do you try to take out the speck in your brother's eye and and, uh, uh, fail to remove the log in your own eye? The beam. But then notice what he says. He doesn't say, Go remove the beam from your own eye and leave your brother alone. No, he doesn't say that. Nor does he say, well, first of all, how would he say remove the beam from your own eye? Again, if you can't distinguish sin from virtue, if you can't distinguish what has to be removed, you can't remove it. So, of course, we know the difference between right and wrong. So he says, well, remove the beam first from your own eye. And then what does he say? Then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. He doesn't say, never mind the speck in your brother's eye. He doesn't say, it's okay to have a speck in your eye. No, we're to call other people to repentance. We ourselves are to repent, and we're to bring everyone else with us because that's the road to happiness and fulfillment. But Jesus says, yeah, remove the beam from your own eye, but then you'll see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. He's not taking away our responsibility for our brother. Or when he lashes out against the scribes and Pharisees as hypocrites, He said, you scribes and Pharisees, you pay tithes on mint and cumin and and you neglect the weightier areas of justice and the love of God. These others you should have observed without neglecting the rest. He doesn't say, oh, well, you know, observe these others, but never mind about anything else. Again, he doesn't say that. Without neglecting the rest. Jesus says, do it all. Do it all. Observe the big things, observe the small things. Bring yourself to repentance and call others to repentance. Be humble, but know the difference and point out the difference between right and wrong. Humility clarifies our sins. In fact, it's humility that allows us then to announce to the world what is sin and what is virtue. Because we don't do so out of a sense of superiority to others. We in the pro-life movement deal with this all the time. As you know, my ministry is full-time working to end abortion. Many of you are involved in this pro-life movement as well. That's how many of us came to be connected in the first place. And in proclaiming to the world that abortion is wrong, we don't set ourselves up against and above those who think otherwise. I have over the years established strong friendships with people on the other side of this issue and still have them. I've dialogued with many on the other side of this issue, including abortionists, practicing abortionists. We don't lose our respect for people who disagree with us. But neither do we lose the clarity of what is right and what is wrong 
I remember one time when we were praying outside of an abortion facility with some people and some counter protesters were there and they came up to us afterwards and say, you're self-righteous. And I turned to them and I said, we're not self-righteous. I just stood here on the public sidewalk and said 150 times that I'm a sinner because we had prayed the rosary. In the Our Father, we say, forgive us our sins. In Hail Mary, we say, pray for us sinners. So I said, we just stood here on a public sidewalk and, and declared that we're sinners. And we declared it 150 times. I didn't hear you say it once. So we're not the ones being self-righteous. We're the ones starting with repentance. You know, when you read the letters of St. Paul, if you read them, not in the order in which they appear in the New Testament, but in the chronological order of when they were written, but because that's a different order, you see Paul's increasing awareness of his own sinfulness. Again, this is a sign. You want to be, have a sign that somebody is close to God? Listen for these words that the tax collector said, Oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Because the closer we come to God, it's like pure light shining through a, a, a window. You know when a beam of sunlight comes through, you can suddenly see all the particles in the, floating in the air. They were there before, but you didn't see them. So it is with our sinfulness. Paul begins his early letters, Paul, apostle of Jesus Christ, you know. And then as we, he goes on in writing, goes on in his life, apostle and servant. And then he goes on to say, Paul, not even worthy to be called an apostle. And then in his latest letters, he says, Paul, chief of sinners. When Isaiah was given the vision of God, as you read in the beginning of his prophecy, where we get the words of the every Mass, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord, God of hosts. He saw the glory of God. He said, Woe is me, I am doomed. I, have a man, I am a man of unclean lips, living among a people of unclean lips. In other words, the glory of God that he saw made him aware of his sinfulness. Peter, upon seeing the miraculous catch of fish, when Jesus was first calling him to ministry, what did he say? Remember, they were trying to catch fish. They weren't succeeding. Jesus spoke the word. They caught a miraculous catch of fish. You might think that Peter, the fisherman, would say to Jesus, hey, this is great. Stick around. We can do great business together. We should enter in, start a fishing company. You know, you know what he said? Remember what the gospel said? Depart from me, Lord. Depart from me. I am a sinful man. The glory of God in, before his eyes brought to him sin before his eyes. Now, this doesn't mean we are to be cast down by our sins or discouraged or obsessed. Not at all. We are not to go around glum. Remember, Jesus said also, when you fast, don't be glum. Don't look glum like the hypocrites. There are no sad saints. We don't go around Sad and depressed because, oh, how sinful I am, how sinful I am. That can lead into a false humility, which is nothing other than pride. No, 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 no. We know that we're sinners, but we also know how merciful God is. There's a reason the tax collector had said, oh, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, because he knows he's a sinner, but he also knows God is merciful. So that's why we're not sad. We're happy repentant sinners. We're not happy about our sins. And it's very, very healthy to remind ourselves of our sins. That's why when we, as Catholics, go to confession, we can sometimes confess, as long as it's not because we don't think we're, we're, we're forgiven, but we can confess sins we've done in the past that are already forgiven, that we acknowledge are already forgiven, but that we just want to renew our sorrow for, we want to renew our humility want to remind ourselves not to trust in ourselves. So we remember our sins as lessons for life. But we don't let ourselves be cast down by them. We move forward in freedom, rejoicing in God's forgiveness. Your sins I have cast into the depths of the sea. God speaks to us through the prophets, but one preacher said, yeah, then he puts up a sign saying, no fishing. So we don't obsess over past sins. We do remember them.
but that's just for increasing our humility, which in turn increases our sense of dependence on God, which in turn should increase our confidence in God and our prayers like the tax collector made, which then in turn should increase our joy. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy and your forgiveness. Lord, let us make this Lenten journey in great humility and rejoicing in repentance and rejoicing in the new life that you give us in the one, the only conqueror of sin and death, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.